your bright and shinies, if you would. All right, everybody say cheese. All right, thank you. Well, my name is, as it says, recovery via barbell training. I'm not, I don't expect that I'm going to be quite the order that Brody was, so that hopefully at best I hope this comes across as hearing from your, the brother-in-law that you like with pictures. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have my, uh, I'm 47 years old, I live in Lexington, Kentucky, my wife and I with our six children. So that was a few years back. We, we've got Joneses and dogs, and this is recently. We've got kids ranging in age from now eight all the way up to 20, four boys and two girls. We also have a couple other kids in the house. One of the, when, when Rip asked me a few months ago if I would be interested in coming and talking, one, he, he prefaced it with saying that I had to bring Roger with me. Now Roger is one of my pugs, and these are my training partners. Every day when I'm in, I, I train by myself, in, in, down in the gym, in my garage, and you've got Larry in the front, Roger's kind of there with, in the middle, and Chloe up on the chair there, and, I got a trivia question for you. Can anybody, and Sully and Steve, you're not allowed to answer. Can anybody tell me if you have more than three pugs, you got a pack of lions. If you've got more than three, three or more pugs, what's it called? Mr. Dr. Sullivan? Grumble. A grumble, that's right. So there's my, there's my grumble of pugs, which, a, yeah, that's a, a, a grumble. And there, here is a, here's Roger. It's a, <laughs> so uh, I decided that I am going to, as much as I can, provide a little bit of Roger here for Rip today. Roger no, that's Roger. Larry, 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 there's Larry Love again on the floor there, but there's Roger. And, and Roger's had some, uh, Roger can be intense at times. <laughs> <laughs> and we did go through the Rogaine years. But, you know, the biggest thing is Roger won't stay up out my business. So if, if you can tell, anytime I'm around, there's Roger. But, but all in all, uh, I mean, we work it out. So, oh yeah, and I, like I said, I do have kids. <laughs> and actually in this, in this photo, you may see a couple different nationalities going on there because along with our, the eight of us, we usually have one or two exchange students for the entire year. So this is Roberto on the left and Shihao there beside me. So then there is no family resemblance. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. In April of 2011, during the course of my duties as an insurance adjuster, I was on a two-story roof and fell off a ladder. I'm gonna pre let you guys know that, there's, that some of these images may be a little graphic but I think it, it, it will allow you to get an idea of kind of what, one, what I dealt with. I think you'll be able to get an idea also of frame it in perspective of your potential clients. But I just wanted to give, to, to let you know that, it, that it's not all gonna be pretty, so. <laughs> <laughs> when, I was, so I was on the roof and then I fell off the roof. And you can tell that I'd fallen off the roof because you can see my legs and of course I have a frowny face because I, was, I wasn't happy about that. <laughs> Went right there. So, and for as, as much grief as I give uh, my oldest daughter, she's 17 and her BFFs and like Phil Dunphy says, why the faces? I think I really, I, even back in 2011, I mean, I had selfie written all over me. So somehow, when I fell off, immediately I hit, and I thought I'd broken my back. Everything, it wasn't pain, everything went numb, I hit, and I just lost all feeling, 
fell down. The homeowner came out of the house. I could hear him approaching, and he was like, oh, Jesus Christ. I said, no, 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 I'm fine. I'll be right up. He says, no, no, you're not. And so he called 911, and just by chance, I had an old, an old Blackberry in my pocket, and I got, my wife was home in Lexington. I was in Charlotte working. And I wanted to call her, let her know, look, I've had an accident, but everything's going to be fine. You, you know, I, I certainly wasn't going to tell her at that kind of distance. I, I think we were, we've got some issues. But she found out, so she made arrangements to head to Charlotte. Well, ambulance came, loaded me up. We, went, we took the ride to the hospital. Although they split, you know, took my pants, cut them off and everything. They left me still with my Roland Martin fishing shirt and that Blackberry in my pocket. I don't remember taking some of these pictures. But here we have, this was just literally probably 25 minutes after the accident. I took a selfie and I took it. I took it. Well, to tell you the truth, I, I, I don't know where, where my head was at at the time. And I took some photos of my legs. Because at that time, that was kind of how I communicated with my family. I was on the road anywhere from four to six months a year. And I guess I just, in shock, went into whatever I was used to doing. So, but, so I took photos of my legs too. And you can kind of see there's bumps where bumps shouldn't be. And, Got my nice little cardboard casts there. So I remember that was pretty much the last view that I had. And then I woke up to this. A year after the accident, I tried to, I didn't, I didn't want to be a person that was identified solely with it. So right or wrong, I made it a point to go through all the media that we had and I deleted everything. I thought I had. Now, of course, nowadays, I guess, fortunately, you can't ever delete everything. But I went through and took, I didn't want to see it. I, did, I, I figured I'd be growing up from them. So some of these photos, despite it, me putting them in the presentation, I've, re it, I've not really seen them in a while. So just bear with me. So the injuries were such that they're called pilon fractures. And they're, kind of, they're a, compressive, a compressive force injury. Carl, in the w wonderful article that he did about an average guy, explained it very well You know, w when he explained it's almost like hitting someone from the bottom of the bed. Not quite like uh, uh, Kathy Bates in Misery. You know, she came from the side. <laughs> So he came from the side. This is more, comp uh, you know, a compressive type force. And the way it was explained to me as well is that these are often seen in co head-on collisions, but usually it's one or the other foot because you either have your foot on the gas or you have your foot on the brake when the engine block comes up through and stoves your legs. So imagine taking a piece of spaghetti and holding it on end and squishing that way versus a snap. So that's what, that's what I was handling. Handling. So now I don't know how well you'll be able to see these, and I'm definitely not someone who can interpret x rays. And Sully, if you'd like to take a moment, you feel free. But you know, in my, you know, we've got brakes here. This is my right, right foot. You can see here. It, I think all told, when it was done, the, my ortho said there were, he had to repair, I think, five different distinct issues in one, uh, in the le in, I think in the right, and I think seven in the left. So, and here's the left. And I think the, again, you can see stuff going on. So those are the x-rays. And the nice, the thing that's showing up very clear there are those external fixators. Now they needed to put those external fixators on me because my legs had suffered so much trauma there was soft tissue damage, there was an immense amount of swelling, that kind of thing. So they just needed to stabilize them for, at that time, they weren't really even sure how long. So before they could even attempt to do actual r r repairs on them. 
So I was in, inten- I was in Charlotte, was in intensive care because they still had to, they weren't sure about the back issue as well. So I was in intensive care down there, I think for 12 days and then actually transported from Charlotte. I'm very fortunate being, living now in Lexington, Kentucky, you've got the University of Kentucky uh, Sports Medicine, a, a steam, very esteemed clinic, some great specialists there, I live right there in Lexington. So I got transported back to Lexington and that's where I spent my time and decided to, we had to, had to pass time until I could have my surgeries. So based on our understanding, that's a, that's our sunroom. Of course, at the time, that's my youngest daughter, Kira. We were told that things weren't going to things weren't going to weren't going to be good at long run with this. So, in that 12 days that I was in North Carolina, my father-in-law and neighbor widened doorways, built a handicap ramp. I mean, that was I mean, that was going to be life. I mean, that's the only way I could get in and out. I mean, I was in one of them big, giant, recline-type uh, wheelchairs, but it, it was almost uh, scary how quickly the kids became comfortable with it. So this pic- picture here is the first day that I went to see the specialist. This was in May of 2011. This was the first day that I actually went to see the orthopedic surgeon at the University of Kentucky, and he unwrapped unwrapped things and there's where we were. You can see I had pins secure, going right into the bones from the front of the leg and the shins. I won't be able to use medical terminology. I'm still figuring proximal and distal and stuff was sometimes. They kept my legs still from the front and that's the going right through the meaty part of each heel. They ran this big, big stake and I kept it. So that kept that from moving around. So there we got, and then we got zombie foot, Brian zombie foot. So I met with the surgeon. (laughs) And and my surgeon, my surgeon told me that as a, if you guys remember, as a result of these x-rays, that in his professional opinion, that I was shit out of luck. (laughs) I was never gonna walk unassisted again. I'd either be in a wheelchair, or a walker, so and he, and he, put, he put the hardware in, and this was in the end of May 2011. That's the left, you can see we've got screws and bars and pins all the way, all the way up, up both legs. And he, and he sent me home, and life continued on. except now with a dad that didn't walk. But kids adapt, and it's easy (laughs) to live life that way. So I was told for at least several months, I wasn't allowed to walk, put any weight on my legs, stay in the hospital bed, but I had something in my mind that told me different. (laughs) One, we'd start over again. So I asked asked Summer to go up to the Mecca and get me a pair of knee pads and some work gloves. And I started crawling. I mean, at first, I'd been in the bed so much, I, had, uh, I was already starting to lose any sort of, I couldn't use my legs. I could move a little bit because I no longer had the external fixators. But everything was just crawling. So, you know, and Summer wasn't real happy. M- my wife wasn't real happy about the idea of that. So I'd have to time it just right. I'd like halfway slide myself out of the bed one day and up when she wasn't around. I'd do that much. And then maybe the next day, try to crawl over and touch the chair and then come back. So back and forth. Finally, she got the idea and she realized that that that, that was good for me. If nothing else, it was, she thought it was giving me peace of mind. And 
you know, I, I eventually got to the point where I could crawl around the sunroom in our house. I mean, heck, event, I, I, it, it, was common, it was a common sight to even see me at now out the house, down the ramp, crawling up and down our, the street. Our na my neighbors were fine with it. And, <laughs> and we thought everything, everything was, was going well until one morning I woke up and I had a sensation in my left leg that I knew wasn't right. So it was burning. I had developed a fever. I was taken to back to the hospital. It turns out I had a staph and had developed a staph infection in the left leg. And these staph, it's funny, these, these, these staph infections are weird things because had I not had hardware in my leg, my, I guess my own, my own uh, uh, cells, white cells could have fought it and, and I, I, I'd, I'd had a better chance, but because I had this hardware, I guess the cells can't, ident don't, can't identify it. So they had to, th the leg that I had just recovered, I was so close to finally maybe getting a little weight bearing. This is several months in now. We couldn't do that because now they have to start, they have to cut that leg open again, clean that hardware off, sew it back up, and monitor. So we did that the first day. Doctors came back, monitored, came back to check it out. It wasn't working. A few days go by, still in the hospital, it's still having issues with it. That's when Life, life really got exciting because they had to test in the, in, I guess, in the joint of where the foot and the tibia went together. And the only way that that was possible was they had to draw fluid out of it. But they couldn't numb it because evidently something to do with it, it, would, it would affect, it could affect the testing. For whatever reason, they couldn't numb my leg. So in one night, a doc, one, two doctors came in and one, almost like a judo hold, hooked my, hooked my leg and pulled to separate the foot from the end of the tibia while the other, that's, that's my pinky there, kind of showing you the size. It's like, and it was about the diameter of a bicycle needle. And they jammed that thing in once. The guy couldn't do it, do it correctly. I, I bit and I went through that one. The second one, they tried again. That's when you start realizing these things that you hear POWs talk about. And I was talking, I think, with Nick just last night. It almost, I think that all of us have a, almost a pain tachometer where if your body's pushed and pushed, things after that really don't make it, it. I really know, and it's not, I'm not bragging about it at all. I don't know how I got through it, because I passed out the third time. I woke up to three nurses around me. I, get, I assume they were able to do the test and find out I still, it still hadn't cleared it up. So I ended up having two more surgeries in successive days and trying to clean it off. And it got to the point where I'm sitting in the hospital bed, and two of my kids are sitting there with me, and the infectious disease guy's telling me, you know, if we don't get this cleared up, if these numbers don't change in 48 hours, we're gonna have to take that leg from the knee down. For whatever, whatever you believe in, and for whatever, whether it be the doctors or what, fortunately it changed. But I ended up then, for the next, instead of being able to be up and about, you know, I, that was one of the things that I was looking for, was finally testing out to see if I could, you know, even, a, even in a wheelchair, out of a, onto, you know, weight bearing. I then had another two months that I had to go through, except this time they had a thing called a pick line. You see the kind of the St. Bernard look. And it was a, a, a line that pumped heavy antibiotics 24 seven into a hole in my arm and that, line went into, I guess, my heart, you know, around there, because that helped it really move the stuff through, because, you know, I wasn't out of the woods yet with it. So, finally, 
we have my doctor, and I go back, and he says, all right, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty much, we're going to take your bandages off, and here's what we found. Now, the reason I want to share these photos is I want you to kind of just take a mental picture of these, in particular, looking at the calves. Dim calves, I think. You see, I mean, it's the, that my legs weren't much bigger round than my than a, than a wrist, and so there was nothing. Muscle, the muscle was gone. Reason that's important was someone at some point is going to tell you that's not start. I'm not going to be able to do do that program. All you guys, all you, you're either young. I mean, you've already got muscle. That's what it is. It's just now you've transferred you know, the CrossFit that you did, or the running you did, or the ex-football player, those are the guys that can do that kind of stuff. Not me, I mean, look at me, I'm 50 years old, I've never done anything, or, this shows you that you can start at zero with the right program, and that's the kind of program that we have. So, my doctor said, all right, you're now cleared for weight bearing, we wish you the best, and he sent me to now we went, he wished me the best of luck and sent me to my physical therapists. Now, don't take this personally. All physical therapists aren't like this. Some are actually female. And, but despite this, now mind you, all I was interested in learning to do was being able to walk. I couldn't care if I didn't know about barbell training, but I couldn't care if I rode a bicycle, I didn't care if I rode a horse, if I ran or upstairs, downstairs, I just want to be able to walk. So the way they were going to get me to walk was they wanted me to take a can of soup, put it on a towel, and use that foot to crunch it. Bring it up, bring it back, bring it up, bring it back. So I had 12 visits. I'd go to the physical therapist, they'd let me move around and they'd bend and then ice my legs and after the 12th visit they'd always tell me, now remember, go home and do your, do your toe crunches with your can of soup. I, I, I've, that's when I decided, you know, the crawling thing worked. So I started going to the YMCA on my own, taking my little walker driving over there, I was able to drive now, and I'd walk, walk her myself in and start using one of those. I don't even know what those things are called, but it was me and Ethel and Harv <laughs> all sitting on this thing, and I mean, we, I, mean I, I got to I learn the insides of when bingo night was. I mean, had great conversations, but that's where I thought I was gonna rehabilitate myself. And then destiny happened. My iPod fell down beside that machine. And I couldn't bend over, because I had this hardware in my leg, so I couldn't bend over, so I squatted. I'd never squat before, and it wasn't a correct low bar back squat form, I guarantee. <laughs> but something about that movement, this pain and this constant pressure that I'd had in my legs, something about it made it feel better, it moved, it shifted. So I decided I was gonna start learning about it. So I started searching about barbell training, Googling, doing, doing the Google, and you know, I found out all, about all kinds of stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't really sure, I hate to have to go back just a hair, which, which Roger it was I was supposed to bring what a lot of people think who this guy was is actually this guy who now looks like this guy. <laughs> and <laughs> So here's, here's what happened with me. I, Word bubble. <laughs> so, so I kind of, I found out about this barbell training, not specifically starting strength at the time. Mar, starting strength was among, I found, saw starting strength, strong lifts. So I kind of knew that, you know, I want to do this squat thing and bench press. It looked easy and simple. So 
I started doing some body weight ones. You know, I'd take my walker into the gym. I'd do body weight squats, walker myself back out. I could lay down. I, my arms, my upper body was a little, little uh, stronger, but I, I was weak, 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 weak. I had aspirations though. So I found the starting strength forum and I wrote, I don't even know where I put it. I don't know whether it was in a train, like in the training log section or like under recovery. And I, I, it was something along the lines of, like I've, I've had these leg, uh, the, these leg breaks. I broke my legs, pelon fractures. And I really thought, you know, I'm gonna get strong again. But I was afraid that if, it would it be possible for me, my muscles to become too strong for my bones and would, if I picked up at the time, I thought, man, if I could ever do one of those squat things with 135 pounds, would that make my bones explode? So I posted that just out into the starting strength net. That was on my Q&A. Was it on your q I didn't think it was on your Q&A. No, I think it was on my Q&A. Couple days go by, I actually kind of forgot about it. And my phone started ringing on a Friday a couple times. I was from Texas. I thought that it was an adjuster that worked for us trying to get a hold of me for some, you know, one thing or another, so I ignored it. Saturday comes along. Here's the same phone number two more times, calling and not leaving a message. I was like, well, if this, I mean, if this guy doesn't, I don't know whether he's working on a claim, but if it was important, I'm sure that he would, that he'd leave a message. So finally Sunday, same, no, same number, it's a voicemail, and I'm like, man, what is this friggin' guy? Brian Jones, why don't you ever answer your phone? <laughs> I said, this is, this, is, this is Mark Ripto. I want to talk to you about your legs. Call me. Psst. And that was it. And life, life changed. For Brian, your rehab was over the day you decided to squat. Now just get strong. I had big plans. That's where I had to start. My, my 78 year old neighbor because I couldn't deadlift, he came over and traced those out. And that's how I started lifting. That's how I started training. My house is different now, though. And I trained. My kids, my kids are used to it. And I started training and trained. Now this is May 14th, 2012, a year and a month after my accident. Coach, I've been experiencing an issue with the left ankle for about 10 days. The ankle and foot have progressively been swelling and have begun to bruise. During training today, warm up sets, I felt some strange movements in the ankle area. Went to the ER. X-rays revealed the bone damages. Appear to have healed very well, but it looks to have pushed a screw out of the joint. So it is now tearing up my soft tissue. I was advised that I would be having surgery to remove the hardware. Now this is the hardware that I was gonna be, have the rest of my life. I'll get back to the program as soon as physically possible because I'm 100 convinced that the squat is the epicenter of my continued successful rehabilitation and as a key to preventing long-term issues due to osteoarthritis in my ankles. And there it was. There's the original over there and you can't really see it. I, I, but not only was it pushing, my legs were grow the bone was growing back. Not only did it, was it pushing the hardware out, but 
I don't have the, the uh, right leg. It started bending, some bending the hardware too. So a few days later, I updated Rip. I was told that the ankle shows signs of rapid healing and that there are indicators that the area has increased in thickness beyond average healing. Now this is coming from, the, from, the sur from my uh, orthopedic surgeon. They could not definitely say whether the density has increased without running tests, but that what they were seeing was rapid, thorough healing of the bones, causing the hardware to be forced out of position. This being the case with the absence of pain leads them to believe that I'm experiencing exemplary recovery. While I could not get anyone to say squatting is doing this, I did get the concession. <laughs> no, no, no. That's you know, I, did, I did get the concession that the results were not average and that absent any pain, I should continue doing exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> so I decided once I had the surgery, so I had that surgery, they removed the left side and now you better damn well believe that that right hardware was coming out. So I went back that in May, went back to the training as soon as I could and by Thanksgiving, I had, the, I had to have surgery to have the other side removed. All this still just doing the program. The only thing that I didn't do at the time were power cleans because of the jump, you know, for obvious reasons, the jumping and, and whatnot. Now, of course, at any time, if anybody has any questions, don't hesitate, don't hesitate, you know, just holler out, raise your hand or anything like that. So from Thanksgiving, from November, now to May, so two years after the accident, that I was going to be in a wheelchair or a walker. Two, year, two years and a month after, and a month after the accident, after the surgeries. Instead of being in a wheelchair, I competed in my first powerlifting meet. And, <laughs> And while the numbers, the numbers weren't huge, for me, for me they were. And I was, I was happy to end up at that time with, from going from them plates to a 500 pound deadlift at that time. So the month after my meet, I was able to actually meet this guy at, at uh, a seminar at Mac and Jillian's. And I'm not gonna, I, I, I could go on a lot. I, I've got other, I can, off the record can tell you guys, if you guys would be interested in some of the things that happened to that seminar, I'll be glad to talk to you about them. There was a great, ex great exchange that happened with me actually, Rip taught me the power clean and I was able to, to, to do it to, a, to a degree. After that, I started getting a little cocky like some of us do. So, you know, I went out and did Jim's thing for a bit, fiddle farting around down in, the, in my gym. I have to give Jim Steele some credit as well. Jim, like Rip, re reached out and he helped me, so helped me along the way. So I did some, did, worked with Jim, and I even did some of Paul Carter's stuff. But I always ended up coming back to my little buddy <laughs> and, and, star and starting strength. The reason being, the reason being, not only because of the program, but I referenced my power clean but the empathy and compassion that you get. February 2014, I wrote to coach and said, I'm still, here's, I want to get a technique check on my power clean. I've been working on it. This is coach. Now that you've proven to yourself and us as well that you can in fact perform a sort of fat wheezing guy power clean <laughs> to a reasonable standard, why don't you just stop doing them since they fuck you up and all. <laughs> Like, love, Lo love, and there are my numbers currently, there are my current numbers, again I'm just squatting, benching, pressing, and deadlifting. Uh, at my meet, my squat was a 330, my current training sets I'm at 320 by 5 by 5s, uh, my bench total at the meet was 260, my last session on Thursday I was 
at 295 by 3 by 5. And my deadlift, I pulled 500. Training set's still around 500-ish, but I pulled 605 in, in 2014. So, and my press was at 140, and I'm now at a 205 by 3 by 3 in my training progression. That's where they started. So don't let, don't let someone tell you they can't do it. They don't believe they can do it. It's just by chance that I had that attitude that I, that this attitude met with that attitude and it happens. Sometimes you have, you're going to have to pull it out because people need you to believe in them. People need someone, need to know someone to believe in because it's a scary thing. It's a starting strength community. I mean, I've grown, I've grown with this. Where else am I going to meet the guy who aspires to be the world's strongest pianist? Organist. 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 Where else? I've met fellows that show you can make an impact and change lives and not have to twerk. Got macros? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I met a guy that showed me you can wear tube socks and still be, well, guys wearing tube socks. <laughs> I've, find, I, I've, been, I've pondered the age-old question folks have challenged me. Which came first, the man or the bun? <laughs> and, and I know definitely that if I were ever to hook up with the brown Care Bear, I know what my child would look like. <laughs> Every day when I go down into the gym, that's what I see. You know, the, and I had never been a fan really before, but the Goo Goo Dolls have a song, and in there it says, it's scars. <laughs> scars are souvenirs you never lose. The past is never far. A wheelchair or a walker. A wheelchair and a walker I'd have never been able to run around the World Chicken Festival with my kids. <laughs> That's barbell training. Wheelchair and a walker. I couldn't do the service projects that I do with friends. It's barbell training. I can ride bikes. It's Walter. I can even chase down the greatest college coach and Hamper him, grab a hold of him for a selfie. If anybody doesn't know, that's John Calipari, the coach of the University of Kentucky Wildcats. Fish. Celebrate. And I can take real artsy black and white <laughs> deadlift photos. You can, I can't do that with a wheelchair or a walker, but ironically enough, I can't take a picture with a walker. <laughs> you still got the walker. Yep. Yeah, it stays in, that in the boot stays right there in the gym. I see it every day. Is that the wide? Yeah, this is, this is summer. And it wouldn't have mattered whether wheelchair Walker. She's been through everything. But what Barville Train did do. You married over the station. <laughs> <laughs> Barbell training allows me to still have moments. So that's about it for the pictures. We know increased muscle. Range of motion, increased bone mass, 
flexibility. These are all things that are part of this program. There's an opportunity out there for you guys as starting strength coaches. You know, you hear the adage, kick ass and take names. I think you guys should make money and change lives. There's demographics out there that need you. And it's not the ex-football player, 24 years old, that's one to add to his powerlifting total. It's a guy that wants to pick up his kid. It's a 65-year-old woman who's lost her husband and is afraid to go into the basement because she doesn't know if she can come back up the stairs. At our age, we've got more money than those kids do. We got more time, we're more likely to pay you if you help. So you've got, you've got a business opportunity out there. But I really feel like because a starting strength coach knows a better way, you guys know that you can make a profound difference And I believe you have a responsibility to find that opportunity, like that man did, to change a life from that to, to that. That's it. Thank you.